Hi, I'm Joydeep Gupta. Uh, uh, as you can see probably that this, we are doing this webinar, you know the subject and that's why you have joined. We all know that it's an important subject of how to keep ourselves safe uh, during uh, covering COVID-19. So uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, one is that you are all muted and that's part of the software. So whenever, whenever you have any questions or uh, uh, for any of the two panelists, Ida and Sneashish, just use the Q&A uh, button. Okay, use the Q&A button and put it there. The, the, don't, don't use the uh, chat button to ask questions. Chat button is for any conversation, other comments or conversations you may want to have, uh, but use the Q&A for your, to ask your questions. So then the panelists will be able to answer them easily. So I know that we have started late and sorry about that, that we have started late. There were some software issues that we needed to sort out. So let's get into it straight away. We have two very good panelists today who know this subject very well. We're going to start with Ida Juste. We're very thankful to her. She is joining us uh, from Durban in South Africa. Ida is the Internews public health expert, and she has done a lot of media training on issues of public health. And she has been doing in recent weeks, she has been doing a lot of work on how journalists can keep themselves safe. Snehashish, many of us know, he is the president of the Kolkata Press Club. He is a news anchor in Doordarshan, Kolkata. He is a media trainer. And very recently, he is the co-author of a guide on how to keep yourselves safe, especially how audiovisual journalists can keep themselves safe while doing work on the field during COVID-19. So I'm going to uh, first ask Ida to talk to you and then Snehashish and then we'll leave as much time as possible for questions and answers. Just one more thing, and then I'm going to stop and hand it over to Ida. I know that we have a lot of attendees from Bangladesh. If any of them wish to ask their questions in Bangla, please do so. Sneashish speaks Bangla, uh, that's his mother tongue, and he can uh, uh, take questions in Bangla. Having said that, Ida, all yours. Thank you so much, Joy Deep, and hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be joining this very, very important discussion. I feel incredibly passionately about this specific issue, um, and I hope that whatever we discuss today, and I think that Snehashish and I might be saying some of the same things, um, that's okay, because it bears to be repeated. Um, I hope you go and share it far and wide. Um, I would like to um, share my screen and hope that you can see it uh, properly. Oopsie, I uh, missed the wrong one. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. Um, you know how it goes, we practiced this and now I do not find the right one. <laughs> uh, okay, in any case, I will, I will uh, just uh, do a brief introduction and say that at Internews, we have looked at very many of the aspects um, of COVID-19, but the safety aspect is one that wasn't quite there right at the beginning in people's minds. Um, it is, is as if journalists started covering the science, the horror, and all of that. And now there is really a moment when journalists are taking note and editors and newsrooms are taking note and they're saying, how can we um, ensure that we stay safe and, stay, and keep all of those around us safe while we're covering this issue? So in a moment, I will be able to share my screen. Um, I'm so sorry, we practiced this before. And now, um, now I have a little bit of an issue with that. I'm very sorry, because I'm sharing the wrong one. Um, Joy, if we could just go to you for a minute, please. Ida, I, I, I have your presentation. Shall I share it from here? I could do that. Hmm? The wrong one is just coming up at the moment. I'm sorry about that. And not, not a problem. I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. Yes, thank you.
Yeah. Is is this the one? Yes, please. Please go from the first slide. Yeah. Okay. Just go to slideshow and play from beginning. Well, I'm clicking slideshow. Just go to slideshow on your screen, you know, um, and then you just, once you're on slideshow, you click play from start. Can you see that? You see slideshow? That's right. Now you click from beginning. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so, uh, look, I think uh, what I would like to say is that obviously we all know that it's a principle in medicine. Uh, to first do no harm. And many times we speak like that um, in terms of journalism as well. First, do no harm. Um, and in actually in the case of COVID-19, I think we should consider first do no harm to ourselves and do no harm to others. Um, Joy Deep, can you share it so that the full screen is visible to everybody? I, I, okay. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So, um, please go to the next slide. So this uh, particular graph um, is well sourced. It's from a credible source and it shows us something very important about how, the, how this virus works, which we sometimes tend to forget. I know there's a lot of focus on the numbers. Uh, many people, just stay on that slide for now. Uh, many people um, in many countries, in all of the countries around the world where we follow this virus, kind of uh, seem to have, and I, I include myself in that, a bit of an obsession to keep tracking the numbers. How many people are known infections in each country? We track those numbers and we also track the number of deaths, unfortunately, in those countries. And we feel as if we uh, then get a sense of how widespread COVID-19 is in our countries. But that's actually a false obsession because we know very much now from the science all the way back to those early times from Wuhan and in all of the other countries where scientists have been tracking how this virus works, that it is absolutely perfectly possible to have no symptoms yet to have the COVID-19 infection or to have only mild symptoms um, and to be infected. And we also know that all of those numbers, don't, don't go away, I'll tell you when to go to the next slide, thanks. So that in all of those countries um, where we all of us uh, obsessively checking the numbers. We are only checking the numbers of those who are known to be infected and who have tested positive. We are not seeing the numbers reflected of all of those who are not infected and those who have not been tested. And guess what? As we can see from that pyramid, those with mild cases and sometimes also those with no, uh, uh, those with mild, only mild symptoms and those with no symptoms are actually also infectious. So what we see around us when we look at hospitals that are overwhelmed and burdened, and when we think about all the systems that, uh, symptoms that we've all come to know so well, um, there is something that we are missing, and that's the fact that we ourselves, as people, whether we are mothers, fathers, cousins, uncles, grandchildren, grandfathers, whoever we are as people, we are possibly infected, we are possibly infectious. 
And so are the people we are interviewing, whether it's a government minister, whether it is a, a nurse, whether it is somebody in the street, a child, anyone around us who looks to us to be healthy. We're forgetting that important point about the science um, of this virus. So people are vectors. We as journalists are vectors of the spread of COVID-19. So you can go to the next slide. And then we just consider that that, of course, presents an incredible dilemma for journalists because we are saying let's no, do, do no harm to ourselves. In other words, let's not expose ourselves to the virus, which is why the lockdowns and the physical distancing regulations are out there. Um, and of course, also do no harm to those we are interviewing. And since we can't see who is ill, I'm sort of in a way uh, realizing that that uh, pre presents a dilemma, but at the same time also presents us with major insights that helps us to not stigmatize anybody. Because absolutely anybody could be, not only is it not somebody's fault whether they're infected or not, but absolutely anybody around us could be infected. So that is such an important principle to bear in mind. And that's actually the science that underpins why these safety regulations that both of us are going to be speaking about today are so important. Please go to the next slide. So there are a whole number of considerations that come into place when, once we've grasped and fully internalized that fact. And the one is, of course, and we've seen around the world, that as soon as journalism and media and telecommunication services started to be designated as essential services, um, on the one hand, I as a journalist um, was excited and I felt validated because I know that how important in this, in this pandemic and especially with the misinformation and the, uh, the infodemic and the misinfodemic about COVID-19, to realize and acknowledge that we as journalists are essential services is a great validation. And I sh I'm sure we, we all agree with that. But that again prevents dilemmas for us because it means that we also are expected to play a very specific role. And unlike health providers and doctors and nurses in, the, in this response, there wasn't the immediate assumption that journalists should also have protective, uh, uh, all of the protective clothing and all, you know, for instance, masks and other items that are available in some cases to those in the medical profession. So very quickly after that designation was made, um, journalists started to say, to demand that they should also have masks. And then in many countries we saw that governments and health departments said, sorry, it can't be, we don't even have enough masks for the medical personnel. So again, that pre presented a dilemma for journalists, but not a, a dilemma that can't be solved. It simply means it's something around which we all needed to gather information. So in each country, there would be guidance about whether journalism and media, whether those spheres of life are regarded as essential services. In each country, there are also regulations and then also realities about whether those participating in essential services can be helped um, by getting free masks, for example. So the point though, you can go to the next slide, is that it is almost certainly the case that there aren't enough masks to go around for everybody. We also know that this de demand got us to question whether masks are in fact recommended or not. And I know there has been debate about the fact that at first WHO said it wasn't really so strictly necessary for those who are uninfected to wear masks. It was, it was, it's more effective in preventing those who are infected from infecting others. And then that guidance changed. And then there was criticism about the change of the guidance. But I think as health and science journalists, we've also come to realize that there is so much evolving science about this virus that we have to, we, we know that the WHO and CDC, to name those two really credible sources, are doing their best to find out what the evolving science and the evolving best practice is. So that practice has now, um, in many countries, turned to, yes, everybody should wear a mask. Everybody should wear a mask when out there in public. So I think then that we as journalists has to have to say, whether they're given to us for free or not, let's find out the best practice. You can go to the next slide on how those masks should be manufactured, where they should be uh, obtained from. Uh, there are, in some places, there's been a price hike in, in masks. In other cases, masks are being donated for free and are being manufactured at large scale. Nevertheless, just go to the best two sources on this issue, WHO and CDC, and you'll see that there is actually a guide on the CDC site on how to manufacture those masks. So let's go to the next slide. 
But I want to say that this preoccupation with masks and a bit of a, you know, I wouldn't, I don't mean it negatively when I say preoccupation. Um, I was a television and broadcast journalist for many years and it must be our preoccupation how we gather news and how to safely gather news whether it is in a war or conflict situation or in this type of conflict situation, because it's almost like similar to conflict journalism. Um, I think that if we are only concerned with whether we should wear masks out there and only concerned with how far away we should hold the, hold the microphone or only concerned with how to clean the microphone, how to clean our camera lenses, there is nevertheless an essential point that we are missing. Yet it's, it's important to know about all of that. But I want to really um, encourage everybody to think about something much more revolutionary than how far away is the mi microphone and how do I clean, how do I clean my equipment? Yes, be fully aware of that. And there's good guidance online and good guidance. Uh, I think uh, Snahashi also has very good guidance on that. But I want to actually emphasize that we think of a very revolutionary way well, not so revolutionary actually, because mobile journalists and online journalists have been following a lot of these principles for a long time. But I think now is the time for absolutely everybody to think, how do I stay credible as a journalist without going out there to the field, without making physical contact with the interviewee, without being an actual physical witness at the scene? And as an editor, I'm now saying the absolute opposite of what I used to say as an editor. As an editor, if I saw a journalist sitting at their desk, I would say, why are you here? You must be out there where the story is. We know the famous story about how journalists should be in restaurants and bars to pick up on stories, not only to pick up clues and leads, but also to report on stories. It's about being out there in the field. That's our entire DNA as a journalist is about that. And now we're asking, and now we're saying we should do think radically different. What if we were to do these stories with, without any physical contact with the interviewees and with act, without being the person who physically um, is the eye, are the eyes and ears on the ground? Let's go to the next slide. There are ways of doing this. There are ways of doing this and maintaining our credibility. If we look, for instance, at this um, image from Thailand, where journalists were uh, filming a news event, yes, they are all wearing masks, they probably um, might be informed about how to clean their equipment. But there is a major mistake out there, and that is the fact that these journalists are still standing too close to one another, and they are too close to the subject that they are interviewing. So what is the revolutionary way in which this could be different and should be different in future? Let's go to the next slide. So among those um, uh, on the call here today, I think many would be dialing in from home. And I know that most or many newsrooms around the world have instituted, for instance, shift services or have allowed or even, I hope, instructed their journalists to work from home. It doesn't mean that we immediately know what to do next. Um, I also am very aware that not everybody has the luxury of a great laptop and a kitty cat sitting in the window and having more than one device to work from. But this is just to act as inspiration to say that a lot of what can be found on the internet and a lot of what's available of the best of social media. I mean, some of the most wonderful advice is coming to us on Twitter. It's also easy to demonize social media when we sometimes forget how much great stuff there is on social media. Some of the mo most wonderful influences um, on this topic, including, of course, the WHO, including journalists like Laurie Garrett, who's regarded as the top social media influencer on COVID-19. They are all posting content. What we're discussing today here is content. There's a story in what we're discussing today. So all of the webinars we're all attending, all of the social media we see, are sources for stories that we could be telling about COVID-19. So let's go to the next slide and talk about how, I hope you can see that clearly enough, um, how in television um, and radio and online production um, and with social media, much more can be done to um, ensure that we are safe and still gather the news. Now, in television, um, I know a, a broadcast, a television current affairs journalist in South Africa um, who hasn't, as in, in the past four weeks, been out with a TV camera in the streets at all, but he has produced great current affairs pieces. How does he do it? 
he asks his former contacts, not new contacts on, on WhatsApp, but his former contacts to send him either their voice, voice recording or he phones them on a WhatsApp call, um, or he asks them to record something, send him pictures and send him videos on the issue that, that is being discussed. The issue could be something like, how are people coping with lockdown? Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that his stories are all soft or feature type stories. He actually manages to handle hard hitting stories by simply contacting his former contacts and asking him to send the, the, the material on, um, uh, on, on WhatsApp through audio files, video files and photographs. In radio, it's been a clear and easy thing to do if, you know, for the past 20 years or so, that call in radio and talk show radio is wildly popular. It simply requires your guest phoning in from home, your um, interviewee, you phoning your interview and you can link them up. Yes, there is still the dilemma that most often um, studios are still required to get the signal out there in radio, but those staff can be absolutely minimized and so that the actual input or news gathering reporters um, can all be at home and doing this via, via, via telephone. With online production, it's been um, the case for a long time. Mobile journalists, um, online um, uh, production is about gathering sources online, um, and then I want to say, no, don't just re rely on what you can find on the internet because it may risk um, either plagiarism or kind of just repeating stuff that is already out there. As journalists, we always want to gather new information, new pictures, new voices um, to make our stories fresh. So just use those former contacts, just, just gather the information um, uh, from them in a different way. Of course, this uh, means our internet must be stable. Data does cost. Again, hopefully the telecoms um, companies in the countries where you're dialing in from have already stepped forward and made data costs more affordable. Um, and if not, we can also use our journalism to advocate for that. Let's go to the next slide. And say that, um, so Moby, Moby journalism or those very many mobile journalism practices, maybe after this uh, webinar, we can also forward you examples of journalists who've really successfully done this for a long time and are able to just take those skills forward with COVID is of course we mean mo the mobile phone, not the mobile person. So this time we're around, we're saying the person stays mobile, you the journalist, stays, mo stays, uh, stays, sorry, stays stationary in your home and gathers this through the techniques of mobile journalism. Um, WhatsApp audio, I think all of those have already been mentioned. And I think it also is a call for us to kind of just ask around and hear how successful Moby journalists are doing this and crowdsource all of the best innovative practices. Let's go to the next slide. So um, another example I know of where once again, we can still be out there and gather fresh news, not just recycle um, other images and other pieces of audio, um, is that uh, for instance, an example I know of again in South Africa, I know these examples better because I happen to live here, but look for examples where you are as well, is that for instance, in terms of court reporting, what has happened is that through agreement between the South African National Editors Forum and media houses out there, the agreement has been that only one media house would be let into the court, that they would record the proceedings and then this is available for share. So this is a way of media houses kind of clubbing together, competitors even clubbing together for the sake of everybody's safety. All those in court and all of those journalists who are now, who now no longer need to be exposed to an abundance of people. And yet the court reporting is still accurate because it's still the same court proceeding. So you can just apply this example to so many other areas of life out there. Of course, it means that editors must buy into this, must fully appreciate this, the uh, editors and media owners must fully appreciate the need for this. So I would say for those working in um, organizations and associations which work on uh, media freedoms, which work closely with editors, and if there are editors on the line, please do consider, you know, a, a formal revision of editorial guidelines to help journalists kind of navigate this difficult path of how to stay safe while on lockdown with COVID-19. So let's go to the next slide. 
So I think apart from um, gathering the fresh information and telling those um, stories in the ways that I've just described, I think there's also a great opportunity um, for journalists to really practice that skill that journalists uniquely have. And um, perhaps those who are now uh, all able, you know, on social media, everybody is a content creator and everybody can post as we know, but journalists really have the training, the background and the skill to know how to make meaning of events. So this is really a golden opportunity in a way for journalists to use that meaning making skill of theirs, connecting the dots, putting different, you know, making comparisons across countries, for example, um, comparing uh, what what a prominent figure has said now and compare that to what he or she has said um, a month ago and making meaning of that story, still telling the COVID story, not necessarily even gathering new information, but using our minds to make connections and connect the dots. So go to the next one. And I just wanted to say, obviously, staying safe isn't just about staying physically safe, but the whole, you know, misinformation, the epidemic of misinformation that we have, um, and the fact that people are fearful, it's really scary, and there's a lot of new information out there, and people are trying to make sense of it. So I'm sure none of us have ever been on so many WhatsApp groups before and have never received so many WhatsApp messages and of course just the abundance of misinformation, uh, which is an indication of the extent to which people are trying to understand this, trying to provide solutions, maybe trying to get over their fears. So unfortunately, there are also those um, malignant actors who are playing into fears and biases. So this, this, this abundance of sharing, this kind of online life that we have now, this webinar here would not have happened, um, you know, two months ago, um, has also created an opportunity for more hacking, for more of, uh, you know, for, for, for us to need to ensure that we are digitally safe, more so than ever before. You may have heard the hacking of Zoom, we're all talking on Zoom now, because Zoom has then also responded and made the, the platform safer. Let's go to the next slide and remind each other that it's not only via social media that this misinformation happens. So as you see on the next slide, mainstream media is also, so just go to the next slide. On mainstream media, there is equally, um, you know, just an abundance of information that is confusing to the public. I'm not suggesting that prayer is bad, but we, aren't, we do know that it will not be the cure for COVID-19. Go to the next slide. Part of staying safe to me is a bit about staying sane as well. And to stay level-headed means we, we do need to work harder even than ever before to protect ourselves as journalists from this misinformation because we could be an amplifier of misinformation if we're not absolutely sure how to navigate this area. So one kind of hashtag that I always think of is that if you get something and you don't know what the source is, just don't forward it. Don't actually, it may be noise that distracts from the bigger story. Consult those resources that are available on how to debunk myths. And then also do not only a fact check, but an actual reality check. We often phrase it like that at Internews because we need the right facts, but we also need to consider why is it that people believe the things they believe. And perhaps we'll have a bit of empathy from them or we'll have more of an insight on how to counter uh, those pieces of information that people seem to believe, even though we, we can't quite understand why. Go to the next slide and say that staying safe is also staying safe in terms of our own, our own mental health, obviously. Um, it is, it's unprecedented that so much negative news, so much information that makes us feel insecure about the future happens across our screens and in our brain every single day of our lives. So there are organizations, you can simply do a Google research, Google search and search for mental health and COVID-19 and you'll find lots of resources. But I think journalists particularly are actually even more exposed to it than the general public. So just take care, take breaks occasionally from COVID-19. I think we do all need to. And we just, I think many of us have felt this increased um, impulse to connect with loved ones and that's a good impulse to act on. And the next slide is just uh, how I would like to wrap it up and to say the only way to stay really safe is to stay at home, but of course equip ourselves with the tools and the skills 
to remain credible as journalists. And there are lots of questions that arise out of all of that. I've put them on the next screen. If there's time, we can uh, handle them, or you may, I know that also your own questions are coming in um, as, as the two of us will be talking. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. Thanks a lot. Right. Uh, I, I found it very useful. I'm sure the, all the participants did. But uh, we are running late, uh, as Ida were, uh, pointed out, and she was, I could see that she was trying to wrap up as quickly as she could uh, rushing through. So let's go straight to Snehashish. Snehashish, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Joydeep. Thank you, Ida. It has really given us a great opportunity to uh, go for uh, this kind of webinar uh, because this is very useful. I believe that uh, just give me a moment till it comes. Uh, I'll just do. Uh, it's enabled to put like this. Full screen to put up. Right. Right. Go to. Are you approved? Okay, so it's, uh, oh, no. uh, Jaydeep, would you kindly uh, do the same thing or I'll, I'll just, uh, now it's on the whole screen. Can you hear me, Jaydeep? Yes, we can hear you and uh, you're, it's showing as full screen now. No problem. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, I, I'll just check. <clears throat> okay, now this is the, uh, the title slide. I think uh, there are many things which uh, Ida and I have common, so I'll not go for that. Uh, the, I think the crux of the matter has already been explained that we need to remain safe. We have no reason to make others unsafe and we need to know how we can work from a distance. So definitely our goal should be to cover news, not to be news. If something happens to us, we will be not as a byline, but not as something else to become a headline, which we don't want. And we should know that we should not uh, go for that. So that is very important. I would last just like to mention that we have covered general strikes, riots, curfew, terrorism, public unrest, fire, house collapse, natural calamities like earthquake, even tsunami. We have covered diseases like swine flu, dengue, plague, SARS, and many other crisis situations. But we had no experience of what is happening now with the threat of spread of dreaded coronavirus. So this is something new. And the journalists need to be active in a slightly different manner. We need to address a slightly different. So what is our responsibility as a journalist, as an individual and as a citizen? We have a responsibility to our own self. We have a responsibility to our family and we have responsibility towards society at large. So which means that I need to remain safe and I cannot make my immediate family unsafe and I cannot do anything that I'm instrumental in spreading the virus and I do not become the entire society vulnerable. Oh, well, uh, that is exactly what I said that uh, uh, Ida has also mentioned that we have been made as a part of the essential services, but that does not mean that we can move anywhere and elsewhere. We also need to scale down our human resources, which means that uh, we actually can work from home on some days and maybe in a week, two days, you are bound to go to office for several other things, depending on the, uh, the facilities available in your own country, in your own workplace. But no matter where you are, we can scale down our human resources and we can do it from a distance. That is exactly the crux and we must know. Uh, what is locked down and uh, the, the social distancing, the journalists are to go. I mean, as Ida has explained that, yes, our thing is, what are we doing in the news? We need to go to the field to collect information. But now, as she has explained, we call it a remote recording, distant recording. And we, the, the video conference, you see where I am in the city, the chief minister of the state uh, does a video conferencing on every other day or so. And the journalists are not present over there in that particular place or in that particular room. And we get the material, the video and the Facebook and other social media up, uh, uploaded. So I can receive all these things sitting in my workstation and I can act accordingly. So video conference, providing video output, Facebook Live. And uh, 
I give you an example that uh, we have had uh, certain stories made by certain channels on reactions of important people, celebrities on being locked down. So instead of going to each and everybody's place, they have requested them to record and send them the video, record in the mobile and send them the video. And they have done it and one has compiled maybe from somewhere else and uh, so just placed it to the playlist and sent it in the server and it was being played. So they're perfectly all right. So the remote recording, the distant recording, and as it has already mentioned that we don't bother about quality at this crisis moment, at this trying time. This is the time our most important is uh, our most importance is on safety, not on quality, and uh, sharing the visual. And uh, as uh, she has been given an example of uh, court reporting, we do a lot of uh, places where uh, physically uh, fifty camera persons cannot stand, so one or two goes there, and then uh, on, on the con on the condition that uh, the person who has been allowed will uh, su supply it to the others. We call it a pool. So in pool, one goes to event number one, three, and five, and the other team goes to the event number two, four, and six. So this is a pool has been made and then it is being distributed that she has rightly said. Now, what we do uh, in case of um, covering the vulnerable areas like hospitals, uh, unfortunately, I have seen people standing in the queue uh, where uh, many people had come to the hospitals to get themselves checked whether they had uh, had a coronavirus attack or not, but uh, the journalists were, especially the television journalists, were holding the microphone and asking them, uh, "How would you feel if you are detected positive or something like that? What makes you bring um, come here? That did you have uh, any record of uh, foreign travel or etc.?" So all all sorts of questions were being asked. So now my my point as a television journalist is, can't we manage with an establishment shot? and a voiceover of all this information. Or we can stand in front of quite a way with a background shot of that hospital or for the building and do a piece to camera. That means a journalist is narrating all the information which he has gathered. Instead of going there, he gathers information from a distant facility and then he stands away from that uh, with a background shot and uh, saying, narrating the information which he or she had gathered. Now, taking interview of the suspected patients from Q is a big safety threat, not only for the reporter, but for many others in the chain. So these are certain things we need to understand properly. And then there are personal hygiene, like hand wash. We know, I need not repeat, it is being broadcast, telecast, and it's being carried in the newspapers, magazines, social media. So we know what is the procedure with the 20 seconds minimum and the use of hand sanitizers with the 60 or 70 percent alcohol. And another thing I would like to add, uh, which I think Ida will also vouch as a, a public health journalist, that we uh, should not remain empty stomach while walking because that's the time when infection could be coming in and the vulnerability is much more. So we need to be on a uh, full stomach as far as possible. Now, what we do, those who are supposed to go out, who are compelled to go out, what we are supposed to do on return. First thing is we must wash, use clothes, maybe in warm water or whatever it is. We must put our shoes outside, keep our purse, cell phone, watch, notebook, comb, car keys, office keys, etc. separately at the entry point, take bath on return, use a certain uh, you know, uh, antiseptic lotions and all, and don't go close to the children and the aged and maybe we remain in our study, maybe we remain uh, lying on the sofa or the uh, living room, at least uh, the days we are going out. So these are the personal hygiene because we also have a responsibility to our immediate family. We cannot take any risk. Now the mask, a lot of things have been discussed by Ida on this issue. I do not want to repeat, but one thing, it depends on the order of the authority of the government. Now. Uh, the place where I stay, the government has ordered just the other day, whoever is going to the public will have to have a mask. Now, whether N95 mask is available, how much does it cost, how long would it be usable, all these questions are there. Whether it is very useful for those who are not going towards to the patients, to immediate closeness and all, that's a different issue. Now, 
the government has announced and we need to abide by it. And the personal health also, we need to understand that uh, we, most of the time we are on call of the duty and we are uh, chasing news and we don't often care about our own health. Now, this is not the time when we can be so reluctant to us, to our health. Now, we must take care, we, especially at this crisis and a critical moment. If you develop cough, cold, throat pain, fever, or any other symptoms like corona affected, please contact the doctor and your media authority. May have to go for isolation. May not be for you. This is required for others. If you might have got uh, by some means or other, or you have become symptomatic, then it's better not to take the risk. So that mentally one has to be prepared since we are going out, since we are going to clo going close to some people who are uh, close to uh, the, uh, the vulnerables, maybe not directly, but indirectly. I'm not going to the hospital, but one of my colleague has gone and visited the hospital, took an interview, and in the newsroom, I'm working in the next workstation. So then I, I must be mentally prepared, and I told my colleague I should tell him to understand and not go inside the hospital to take the interview, to do it for a remote recording, and to do it by something else. And our personal practice also, we need to change that. Uh, uh, we need to keep a record, those who are going out, that for the last 14 days, where all the places we went, who were the people with whom we came into contact. So this is very important. It will be helpful for contract tracing. In our country, the government, the union government has developed an app where we are supposed to download which will help us in keeping our contact tracing available, making it possible. And uh, inside the office, there are certain places. I may not be required to PCR. I'm, an, I'm, I'm a reporter. I basically work at the assignment. I have my own workstation, may not be in the newsroom, maybe in the bureau or maybe in my own chamber. Uh, otherwise, just to see the bulletin going on live, I might go on the other day, but no, this is not the normal. I should not go to the editing room. Uh, not uh, go to the PCR where from the bulletin is produced, not even go to the studio where I am not exactly required in those workstations I should avoid. And uh, the, the pregnant and aged should opt for work from home. They are, uh, you know, in our government has also said in many media, uh, if you are really aged and uh, you are uh, carrying, then obviously you just inform them and you can work from home. And there are a lot of stuff to work from home and uh, you can in this digital age, because as we are doing this webinar, uh, you see someone is in Durban, one is in Delhi, one is in Kolkata, and someone may be joining from uh, Bangladesh. So you see, it's, it's possible. The digital technology has made this possible. So media should uh, adapt it, because as uh, Ida said, that social media has been working on this. And the personal health norms of the journalists will depend on the overall situation of the pandemic in the area where he and he or she is working. So my norms, health norms and safety norms will be determined uh, in uh, the area where I am working. And obviously Joy Deep safety norms will be determined by the authority where uh, he is staying and he is working from. And Ida's uh, obviously will be done in, the Dur in, in Durban and Joy Deep's in Delhi and in my, in Kolkata. So obviously we need to know that we all need to abide by, and they may change it. Till the, till the other day, we were not forced and we were not made uh, uh, compulsively using this mask. But now in my area, our government has announced it that waiver is going out, should have mask, then I should have mask. So that is it. So it, this norms might change depending on the directions of the competent authorities of that particular area, which will depend on the vulnerability of that particular area where we are working. Now I come to the microphone, as uh, it has also mentioned that, firstly, keep more distance between the interviewer and interviewee. Now, the first and foremost thing, we should go for distant recording. We'll ask them the questions, uh, give them the questions, they should record and send it to us. Or we'll use Zoom or, or any other, for that matter, live uh, 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 apps or live um, um, softwares where Skype or Zoom or which we which are being used, there are plenty. 
or else uh, they record in their mobile phones and give it to them. We could give them a little bit of instructions. But if we are physically recording, now this is a normal condition, the picture you can see, but no, this uh, uh, distance should be far away. You must use a boom stick and so that the distance between the reporter, the cameraman on one side and the interviewee on the other side should be more, the one meter minimum social distancing norm should be uh, maintained. And we can carry a tabletop microphone and we can uh, use it uh, for them because tabletop, I place it and I uh, go back and I, I go, I, I record from a distance. So this is something more distance between the interviewer and interviewee. As far as the user microphone is concerned, uh, you can see in the slide that there is uh, something called head basket, which is kept over the microphone, over the head of the microphone. It has got nothing to do with the microphone. It's just like a cover. It is removable. You can remove it and you can clean it uh, separately. And inside also there is a, a certain sponge being used. You should change the sponge or clean the sponge uh, because uh, this is one uh, place, one piece uh, or one instrument which gathers infection, the virus, because coronavirus is moving through droplets. So if somebody speaks, uh, uh, it, the droplets uh, come out and it can stay there in those baskets and from there uh, it can go to anybody else. And the body of the microphone will also have to be used by a cleaner or alcohol-based cleaning solution. Now, we also have uh, lapel microphones or lavalier microphones or collar microphones. Uh, we would put it in the necktie or the collar. Uh, that is basically to be avoided because that uh, brings uh, someone of you and the crew uh, to go close to clip it or something or it's quite close to the mouth and then when it is being returned, it's accepted, received and carried. So it goes closer to the mouth. So for the time being, this may be avoided. So the head basket you can see, and uh, my request uh, to the audiovisual or audio journalists who are using microphones, please, we have never been doing this in normal time. Uh, maybe our colleagues are reluctant to do it, but that makes us, that puts us in more vulnerability. So we have to be very particular that after the coverage, this needs to be closed, uh, cleaned as we have been showing it and in microphones are to be cleaned also. And the other equipment like camera, lights, uh, which are required for the coverage, if it is required at all for physical kind of a coverage, then obviously uh, we need to clean it. But it is possible for uh, video conference facilities or recording of a press statement, media statement uh, in the mobile and uh, being passed on to several users or put it in the social media or the websites of that particular organizations, which can be downloaded and used. And the Facebook Live or any other thing live is uh, available at live and can be put through to the live transmission of various television channels. But if we are using, we must be extra cautious in cleaning those materials. Well, cell phone is an integral part of everybody's life, more so to the working journalists. And this is another vulnerable equipment. We must not forget that uh, the cell phone, we uh, put it like this and, uh, you know, you handle it constantly and often press it on the side of your face uh, and uh, it can cause uh, bacteria, virus and other junk comes uh, to this phone and which could be easily transmitted, transferred to us. So the disinfectant wipes are safe and spray a non-abrasive or alcohol-based 70% uh, or more isopropanil or disinfectant, anything, soft lint free cloth and wipe down your device uh, while it is powered off and unplugged. So these are the small things which you need to do it regularly and especially when you come back home and uh, it is said that use of paper towels are too abrasive, but the safest and most effective way to clean your screen is a microfiber cloth and the best solution of removing sand and lint and scotch tape. And for that smaller and speaker holes, use a toothpick or try to vacuum with the debris or you put a toothpick to those holes. So we must make it a point to clean this uh, at a regular interval. This is 
you, it's 24 into 7 we are using as a journalist or normal person. And since uh, we keep it somewhere in somebody else's workstation and things like that, this is a major carrier. We need to take care of this. And uh, I see uh, eight things you should never use uh, to clean a cell phone, the window cleaner, kitchen cleaner, paper towels, rubbing alcohol, makeup remover, compressed air, dish soap and hand soap and vinegar. Obviously, this is not a demonstration of a mobile telephone company, so I should not go on details with this, but this is because if mobile phone goes conked off and it uh, is not working, then as a journalist at this moment, we are gone. We cannot survive. This is our, uh, our survival kit. And uh, stay well, keep well, keep well others, even covering Corona. We need to cover because people need to get right kind of information. So our services have been made uh, essential and we need to provide right information and we need to provide it well, in well packaged and well written form. So we need to work, we need, can work from a distance, we, need, we can work from home, but if we are going out, uh, we have discussed both of us that what are the things we can uh, maintain. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think, Joydeep uh, and Ida, I think I, I could do whatever little I could. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nashish. That was very detailed, and I'm sure it was very useful, for especially for television and uh, audio radio journalists. Good. I'm looking at the questions, uh, and I um, I can see the questions, and I'm going to read them out, uh, and then uh, whether it's Ida. Uh, yeah, Snashish, you can stop sharing your screen, yeah, yeah, but yeah. please please stay online because there are questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, the right. Uh, Am I all right? I believe you are. You are fine. You are fine. You are fine. Thank okay. You. Uh, now the first question is to Ida. Is, uh, from Vishal Gulati, it says the COVID-19 pandemic is inflicting major financial damage on media organizations. Managers may find it hard to reverse the fall in ad revenue and find new grants. So what's the sustainability advice? That is a more wide question, I suspect. It's a more wide question, and if you can all follow the chat, I've tried to, uh, I don't say answer that, but to respond to that by saying, I absolutely do not know the answer because I'm not an expert in that field, but just to be assured that um, all of the major media development organizations in the world and including, including Internews are looking at this issue really, really closely because obviously we're all concerned about truth telling and you can't have truth telling if you don't have journalists who are employed to do that. So uh, I do not have the answer. I know it is a very, very serious issue. And um, I know that already inside Internews, for example, and I'm, I'm sure very many other organizations, there are discussions on how we can um, share what we manage to find out also more, more broadly on a webinar like this. So, so I think just stay tuned for that. It is a very serious subject about which I don't know enough. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, it's nice. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, every day, day by day, we have been getting information which is alarming. People, journalists have been told not to come. They have been asked to go for leave uh, without pay. The downsizing has already started. Pay cut has already started in various uh, mainstream, well-established media on one side. As we all know that there has been a downfall in the media industry going for several years, this lockdown, this COVID-19 will kill various jobs in various other sectors, including the media. Media has already become its victim. So for individuals, what I can say, we need to develop ourselves as content writers, content providers. There are various other areas, industries, services who will require content. Every industry requires content. So the diversification is the answer. 
we need to do it and the social media platform is the answer now the revenue model of social media platform is a different question altogether yes there is a revenue model so two answers i can initially think of though it is too initial one is uh, to practice content writing and to work for various services and uh, products and organizations and to make one's presence felt in social media social media also has a revenue model thank you jody for giving me so thanks 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 uh, Shnashish, uh, there is a very specific question for you uh, uh, and uh, so i'm going to read that out before going into the going to the wider questions so this question uh, is from saurav gupta so, uh, so asks if it's feasible for journalists to use the ppe that doctors use well again my take here is if the authority of the country or the state asks you to do it then only you do it there is a shortage of ppe and making ppe is available in adequate numbers to the doctors and frontline service givers like the paramedics nurses ot attendants and those who are dealing with covid 19 positive patients and the patients in the same hospital so the first priority is to them yes there has been places even in india uh, the journalists have been seen uh, wearing uh, the ppes but i think uh, as P there is a shortage of ppe physical shortage of ppe i don't think unless and until who cdc or the renowned agencies and the organ i mean the authorities of the area like state or the center or the country uh, makes it compulsory and those who are not going inside the hospital my point is why should one go inside the hospital and go closer to the person to get the interview time has come to use other digital technology yes uh, so that is my take with ppe we have to okay. uh, understand that those who require it more should get more we are influencers and that we get to manage pps it's not fair right that that point of influencers segues us me into the next question actually which is for both ida and for you uh, the question is once uh, this lockdown is over uh, what would be the role of journalists in uh, convincing our audiences to keep physical distances still Ida? Yes. yes. Shall I take it or Ida? Ida. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's a great question because I think all of us are going through, um, you know, questions in our mind. How long the strictness of the lockdown will endure? And we also understand from the science that even if governments uh, uh, lift some of those restrictions, that the danger will not be open. And then our role is actually even more nuanced and even more important. Um, I would say one of the ways in which we can do it is that our stories, of course, change and shape norms. And so if we um, continue to write those stories that, that um, illustrate how successful lockdowns have flattened the curve or how other countries or even vicinities in our own country have been able to restrict um, the, the, you know, uh, well, flatten the curve, I mean, change the trajectory of the epidemic by, uh, by maintaining good social distancing. Um, I think that's inspiring to people and gives them something to aspire to. That would be one way of doing it. Right. Um, Ashish, you want I, to say I something? Just, I, I, I would just reiterate what she had said, that the covering the best practices, uh, giving examples of two countries and making a comparative story that country A has done it while country B has failed. And we need to follow country A. And if we don't follow, we will become country B. And we need to gather information what is to be done at the time of after lockdown. Obviously, there will be uh, advisories from the competent authorities like government, uh, medical boards and things like that. And our duty is to transmit and create an awareness by virtue of our media, package it well, package the information well, uh, repeatedly transmit those messages so that people understand the necessity of social distancing even after the official ban is over. So creating awareness is our duty and we need to follow that duty because our role is very important. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, now I can see two sets of wider questions. 
one actually i'm going to uh, answer immediately uh, is by saying that we are going to take up the subject in another webinar there are questions on how do we as journalists tackle the spread of fake news on covid 19 uh, i can tell you uh, that uh, the internews earth journalism network is planning to take up this issue in a webinar pretty soon please do join and next week in fact there will be a webinar similar to this as well as handling fake news uh, that is just like this one the timing was made to suit journalists in south asia the one uh, next week will be made to suit the time to suit the journalists in east africa but given that that time difference between south asia and east africa is not much i'm sure all of you can join and please do so we may actually take up the issue of fake news there that's one thing the other other set of questions that i'm seeing is that and this probably needs a little bit of explanation to those who are not in south asia based in south asia is that we are also seeing a lot of unrest on the streets uh, among daily wage earners who have whose incomes have come down to zero and there there many of them are migrants who wish to go back to their villages and are not being allowed to do so under the rules of quarantine and it is a very difficult situation and it's and we are seeing flare ups with some regularity there were two flare ups yesterday in two parts of india that we all know of and that was reported and the questions that i'm look seeing uh, are is that what should we do when there are such flare ups to that my answer is very simple we are reporters we should be reporting them we should be reporting them factually and having said that i'll turn it over to the two panelists first to ida and then to snehashish to uh, uh, say what they wish to say on this subject i think let me pass to snehashish first because i had a long uh, okay. time before uh, yeah yeah okay snehashish you first thank you thank you ida well uh, you see uh, my belief my schooling in the public service broadcasting may be slightly different yes as i said in my presentation that we have covered uh, social unrest we have covered ethnic clashes we have covered uh, certain other uh, arson and public unrest so our main role is to pacify that it's no point to instigate the violence once again in one side we need to cover we cannot leave the story but at the same time our approach should be positive that suppose in one place there has been a gathering of migrant laborers uh, not knowing that no train no bus no arrangements are being made to take them back to their home states but for some fake news for some information for some maybe uh, by some group which wanted that unrest or maybe for some reasons it has taken place so we cannot neglect the story neglect the news we cannot uh, suppress the news but our presentation should be very positive that going through our presentation there should not be instigations that there are uh, uh, the same kind of things erupt in various other places and it becomes another endemic so it's a, a, an approach at this hour of crisis we should not add up anything we need to understand this on one side there's a balance for a balancing act has to be there on one side yes something has happened we need to cover that and on the other side it is our responsibility to see that it does not flare up and it does not recur in various places so our approach should be that this is my take i don't know many people think uh, maybe Ida? agreeing may not yes um i just want to say that obviously um the very the, the dilemma is that the people who are protesting or um expressing their displeasure do need their voices heard and they have a valid point but in first of all in us getting too close to that we could actually be um uh you know create you know you, we've all experienced this as journalists you get closer to something with the camera and the protest intensifies get closer to gather the information and people get more angry so again it's one of those instincts that's a bit runs a bit counter to the way that we've normally been doing things but we do have to think of first do no harm just as snashes has said so in other words in a case like that if i were physically 
in the vicinity as a journalist, I would take a picture from the distance to show, to document that this has happened. And then I would try and find out, uh, usually if there is such a, a protest, there is somebody in civil society, some human rights activist who's well aware of the issues and really try to highlight the issues and say that people have voiced their, um, you know, their concern and their, their need for a solution. But rather than getting so inside of it, we need to think, focus more on the issue and perhaps have file footage. If it, if it is about housing, if it is about general uh, refugee problems, we have, as Nehashis has already said, other ways of depicting the issue. Remember, it is actually ultimately about an issue, not about that one event. The issue has been there for decades possibly and will remain, but we don't need to reflect that actual moment as intensely as we used to reflect it in the past. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, we have uh, very little time left. In fact, we have run over time. So I'm just going to take the last question now because this is an important one. It's come from Bangladesh. Uh, it says millions of jobless poor people are leaving their homes to look for food. They're not maintaining any physical distancing and they often do not have any access to any media outlets. How do we ensure that messages, hygiene messages are conveyed to these people? Who wants to go first? I know Did it's I? a very tough one. Uh, yeah, it's a very yeah. tough one. Um, yeah. So I'll just give you some of the examples of what some of my colleagues who work on our humanitarian information um, services, what they are doing to try to address this is to just acknowledge that um, obviously when people don't have access to mainstream media, there is a major challenge but you would often find that people do have access to, for instance, um, a form of community engagement, or that there are people who do get to communicate um, and, and hopefully also even do two-way communication between that community and somebody with information. And to then ensure that the same safety messages land with that person. So rather than thinking of here's a radio station with its signal or a TV station or a print press that gets to people rather think which individual of which organization does get to those people and ensure just do whatever we can, even just from an, um, a personal capacity to ensure that those people have safety messages and have responses to their questions. Right, Snashish, I'm sure you know of similar situations. Uh, what what yeah. would you say? Yeah, I, I would first like to, to the person who has asked this question to greet uh, the new year though this is not the right time to greet New Year's from that country and to the part of the country where I am in. But yes, that's a, that's a fact of the matter that we are going into the New Year with all those um, problems, but we wish that we will be better off in the coming year. Uh, my New Year's greetings to you. But the next question is, you know, uh, the, the, uh, there are people there are plenty of media. Bangladesh has media uh, plurality. So you can access to one of the media outlets or various organizations, so the, the presence of international organizations, NGOs. There's a huge network of NGOs there in Bangladesh. International uh, aid organizations are there in Bangladesh. Or civil society is very much present in Bangladesh. Firstly, you. Uh, raise the voice of the protest to the competent authority. This is number one, through NGOs, through um, uh, aid workers, through various other ways of civil society. And the next is uh, we need to uh, display this uh, message of social distancing. Yes, when people are hungry, it is whichever part of the world is immaterial. Hungry people will not be able to. It is the hunger which compels them to come out on streets to say that they are hungry. So we need to uh, give this information that it might be hunger which may not kill you, but it could be the disease which will kill you faster. So you need to maintain social distancing. So that kind of awareness campaigns, I, I have full faith in the NGOs and various other organizations, civil societies, and the government in Bangladesh, this information needs to go to the proper people so that they can initiate such activities so that uh, the people uh, get food and ration and also remain inside and do not gather and maintain social distancing. Yes. Thank you, Snashish. Right, we, I know we have to wrap it up now because we've gone over, over time. I'm very, very uh, happy to see that we have had 
participants not only from South Asia, but also from many countries in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and in Europe too. I, I, I can see participants from Europe. Uh, and of course, thanks a lot to our colleagues who have got up very early in the morning in both North America and Latin America to make this technologically possible. Thank you very much. Please, and as uh, has been written in the chat box, we will continue to have webinars like these, important webinars. So please keep a lookout for that. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you have very much day. for this opportunity. Yeah.